Hey everyone, it's Andy Kushner, host of The Wedding Biz, in which I conduct in-depth and revealing interviews of icons and who I feel are the next generation icons of the weddings and event industry. And this is all to provide you with education and inspiration, and really for any entrepreneur, but especially event industry professionals and consumers. And I want to say it is what it is like beautiful weather out there. It's the fall. I, you know, I talk week after week about needing to like take breaks, get outside, take a walk. Unless I have appointments, I'm in the office all day. It's like I got to talk right into a mirror and listen to my own advice. It's crazy. It's so beautiful out. And we all need a break. Anyway, I am also really excited because I am going to be speaking at the special event show in Las Vegas in March on two topics. I'm going to be giving two different presentations. One of them is going to be on leveraging podcasts as a marketing tool for your business. I've given that before many times, and so I'll be speaking again about that. I'm also going to be talking about what I've learned, all the wisdom, tips, advice that I've gotten from interviewing so many amazing people on this show. So I'm really excited to give that presentation as well. So let's move on. Last week, if you missed it, was David Mon part two. Those of you who heard part one heard how just over the top it was. Incredible, incredible. If you missed part one, go check it out. And you got to hear last week's part two with David. David's clients include social leaders from around the world, as well as a who's who of brands and institutions. David is the real thing. So this week, we've had a bit of a change in the schedule. I'm excited to announce it's going to be about Greg Fink. Greg is a wonderful photographer based in Paris. Uh, Greg studied business via a business school in France and then got an MBA in the U.S. And he worked for 10 years as a marketing executive for Procter & Gamble and was starting to shoot weddings 10 years ago while he was there and professionally for five years now. And in spite of it just being five years, he is big time. Greg is, is shooting major weddings. Also, part of his business is in fashion. And he's doing incredible work in the fashion world. Greg really quickly learned how to master and effectively utilize social media as a marketing tool and already has over 70,000 Instagram followers. And we talk all about what he has learned with social media. Greg also gives master classes, workshops in the spring. And very soon, he is speaking at the time of this recording in London at Engage about authentic branding. And we talk all about that in this conversation. Really great, great talk. So enjoy my conversation with Greg Fink. Greg, it is such a pleasure to have you on the show and also to be interviewing you with you being in Paris. I love it. It's wonderful. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm very excited. Yeah, I'm excited to have you too. I I think you have such an interesting background from what I can tell You know, it's interesting. When I was looking at your website, I saw a quote by Audrey Hepburn that you have, which is, elegance is the only beauty that never fades. Mm -hmm. Elegance is the only beauty that never fades. I love that. What? Why did you want to put that on your site? What does that mean for you? I just love that because I think it summarized the approach I try to have in my photography. I just like the timeless elegance of film because I shoot film and we will probably talk more about that. But, I mean, wedding photography can be difficult in the sense where you don't want your photo to be outdated when people will look at them in, like, years or decades. So I really try to bring my aesthetic and I try to bring elegance in my work so that when people will look at these photos in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, um, they will still look timeless and elegant. You know, it's so interesting. You're making me think I had interviewed this sculptor for another show that I have, Extraordinary, Ordinary People, and he sculpts in bronze. And I asked him why bronze, and he said, well, in 10,000 years, people can still look at it, you know, and touch it. And it, it, it was just such an interesting way to think about it. So, it's I like what you're saying, that even decades later, you want people to be able to enjoy it and, and see the beauty. Well, when did this start for you? I mean, from what I understand, your father taught you photography in a dark in a family dark room. Was he a professional photographer? What was that all about? So it was definitely not professional, but he was very passionate about photography. So we had a dark room and an larger and all of the chemistry at home. Uh-huh. So basically, he gave me a camera when I was like something like twelve or thirteen, as far as I can remember. 
And most of the childhood memories that I have is me processing uh, my prints and my necks in the dark rooms. And I remember the smell of it. So I basically taught photography. Um, I basically learned photography, sorry, with my dad as a kid. And this has always been part of my life. Was it black and white that you were doing or were you starting right in color? Mostly black and white, mostly black and white. Uh, I don't know how to process a uh, color neg, but I definitely uh, knows how to do like a black and white uh, negatives. So uh, I shot mostly in black and white. And I think it shaped my high because the fact of not having to consider the colors helps you to focus on the subject. Oh, So... I've always been like a portrait photographer. I remember like taking photos of my parents, taking photos of my friends. I was inviting lots of uh, girls from school at home to make portraits. <laughs> That's a good way to meet girls, isn't exactly. it? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I've always been um, a portrait photographer, let's say. And some of my memories as a kid, I remember like looking at my parents' wedding albums my grandparents' wedding albums. And I was like, well, it's, isn't it funny that like years after, decades after, the first thing you're going to do when you show up to your parents' home or your grandparents' home is that you're going to open the wedding album. So I thought this was kind of magical. And I guess this is all how it all started. That's really interesting. You know, it's funny. I was 13 and I, all, I created a dark room in my in my parents' house in the utility room where the washer dryer was and, and did black and white. And, and I know when you talk about the smells and you know, I, you know, developer and fixer, I mean, I remember the chemicals and, and just the, the power at that age as a teenager to be able to capture images. I just thought it was magical. Like, like the way you're talking about, well, what did you do? It's interesting from what I understand, you ended up going into business school in France yeah. and then getting an MBA, Master's of Business Administration. Did you ever think before you went to school of being a photographer or, or was that strictly a hobby at that, in your mind at that time? It was strictly a hobby and I didn't see it otherwise. So basically, my parents told me when I was 20, um, okay, it's, it's fun to have a hobby, but now it's time to have a real job. So I kind of follow the, the safe path. So I did a business school in France, and then I went to the U.S. in North Carolina. I went to Workforce University to do an MBA. And then I actually worked for 10 years as the sales and marketing director for Procter & Gamble. Why marketing? Why did you choose to go into marketing? You know, it's funny because I think that I didn't really know what I wanted to do back in the day. I started in finance. I interned in finance. I hated it. I actually quit an internship in finance, which was a pretty bad way to start in life. Um, so I tried finance, then I tried sales, and marketing was, let's say, the my favorite uh, path amongst all of those. So that's why I did it, but I was not really excited about it. But I worked for this great company, Procter & Gamble, uh, during 10 years, selling very exciting products like laundry detergents and shampoos <laughs> and razors but i'm very grateful for this experience because i learned so many things and some of the elements that probably make that i was able to build my business uh, so quickly after that well what were some of the biggest lessons uh, some of the biggest things that you learned from being in marketing for procter and gamble that you still use today i think the biggest thing uh, that i've marked me is humility when you work on markets that are so competitive are the ones that we have with Procter & Gamble, like laundry detergent, shampoos. You're competing against like big companies like Unilever, L'Oreal. And if you are not humble, as of a sudden, you can lose so much business. So I try to keep that in mind, my own business right now with everything that I do. Stay humble, respect everyone because you never know who can bring you like amazing business and big business. And I think one of the pitfalls of this industry sometimes is that people forget that. So this is really something that has marked me. Yeah. And the market, I mean, you know, we all know the wedding and events industry is so saturated now, you know, whether you're a photographer, a cake designer, whatever it is, planner, it is just so saturated. I, I think going into it with humility, 
does allow us to be more creative in, in the sense that, look, there is competition out there. On one hand, there's there's a lot of business out there, but in order for us to get the kind of business we want, you know, I agree to go there, to go into it with that humble kind of an attitude is going to just simply allow our minds to be more open, I think, creatively, don't you think? Exactly. So, I mean, humility, hard work, are really some values that are important to me. Uh, it is absolutely a very saturated industry, but on the other hand, you don't need a lot of investment today to get into wedding photography or wedding planning. And that's one of the beautiful things. I mean, it's very easy to start as a company because you can work from home, you can work behind your computer. You just need to set up a website. It's not like you need like millions to start. So it is saturated, but on the other other hand, there are like so many beautiful opportunities. Mm. Well, and, and in a few minutes, I do want to learn more about how you grew so fast because you, from what I understand, you haven't really been doing it that long professionally. And yet you've got great success. You're speaking at Engage in London soon. You're at the time of this recording, it, it's in a, a few weeks, you know, you've got 70,000 Instagram followers. You know, I really want to get into all of that, but for a moment to go back in terms of your transition from being a marketing executive, you know, after 10 years and then deciding to go into photography, can you tell me about that? What, what is it that happened? What were you thinking to leave, you know, as you said earlier, a safe job and going into this much more risky entrepreneurial kind of a position? What was going on in your head when, you know, toward the end of your, your, your time at Procter & Gamble? So it was a very safe job, but I was in a miserable place, like personally. I mean, I didn't enjoy what I was doing and I reached a point where I was almost depressed. I mean, on the paper, everything was perfect. I mean, I was having this great job this great salary, but I was, I felt miserable when I wake up every morning. So what happened is that a friend of mine asked me to shoot his wedding because he knew that I was a photographer um, for her hobby. And I shot that wedding and I was like, okay, that's fun. Shooting weddings is fun. Uh, but we cannot really make a living out of shooting weddings in France because the market is not where it should be. It's not the same as the U.S. So I will keep it as a hobby next to my day job. And that's what I did for five years. After five years, my eye opener was that uh, I went to a workshop and uh, the workshop was organized by Feather and Stone photographers. Uh, I don't know if you've, if you've heard of them. They're based out of California. And I will be forever grateful for these guys because they totally changed my perspective on the market. So I remember going to the workshop and introducing myself like, hey, I'm Greg. I am an amateur photographer, amateur wedding photographer, and I will never go full time because there's no way to make a living out of wedding photography <laughs> here in France. Yeah, Isn't that funny? And the, the, the answer that they had, I will forever remember that was like, okay, you know what? Maybe you don't see these clients, but we fly to France a dozen times per year, and we charge more than $20,000 for these clients. Wow. And I was like, hmm, that's interesting. I kind of want that too. And three months after, I basically quit my, quit my job. Well, but, but before we go there, you said that when you were taking this seminar, we'll call it photography out of California, that it changed your perspective. Is, is that the perspective that you felt that now this is possibly within reach? Is that what it was that changed for you? Exactly. I was feeling like, I mean, every single photographer, wedding photographer in France back in the day, not a lot of them were like professional. Most of them were amateur photographer doing that next to a day job. And that was my vision of it too. So I was like, this is fun to do on the weekend, like 20 weekends a year. This is good pocket money. It allows me to reinvest in equipment. So why not? But there's no way I will ever go full time on that job. And these guys totally changed my perspective on that. But I want to check. So you must have been, what, around 30, 31, something like that in your early 30s? 34, 35. Well, now, were you married at the time? I was actually married. And I mean, it, it's not funny, but my personal life was kind of in the same place as my professional life. 
because the year when I quit my job is the same year when I got divorced. Wow. So yeah, it was kind of a rough year, but to me, it just the symbol that I, I was not where I should be in my life. And that the reason why I kind of felt miserable when I woke up in the morning, something was wrong. I had followed the wrong path uh, since the beginning. And I was, as of a sudden, I felt the urge to change something. And I basically changed everything in a three months course. Wow. Well, Greg, you know, it's interesting. I can really resonate with this. And because I worked for IBM for eight years and then Lexmark for eight years. Yeah. I mean, and, and at the time, well, IBM is a big company, but at that time, IBM was like the Harvard of computer companies. And I sold for them. And, and like you, I learned a lot about various things. But, you know, when I decided to leave and, and, and that was around my mid thirties also, something like that, I had a four year old daughter uh, when I finally left and, you know, I was married. I mean, I, and, you know, in terms of financially, I was really scared. And so I hired a consultant and I had a two year plan to save a certain amount of money and get the, my, it, for me, it's music business, get it to a certain level where I could leave the corporate world and pretty much make the same amount of money. Now for you, were you in that, did you also, were you financially okay that you could switch or did you really take a leap off that cliff and just say, I'm going for it? No, it's funny because I have exactly the same story because my daughter back in the day when I switched was not even four, she was like two and a half. So as of a sudden, I, I go from working for Procter and Gamble and probably making like $10,000 a month or something like this being the owner of an apartment in Paris, being married, having a daughter, to, okay, let's take that leap. Let's take that jump. And as of a sudden, I'm a divorced father uh, with a kid and trying to leave out of photography. So I didn't have a financial backup. But I think the good news about that is that from day one, I was like, you know what? I need to make that amount of money into photography because otherwise, if I don't do it, I will just quit. So I think the fact of not having the backup also helped me to very quickly go to a high-end clientele with high prices because I didn't have a choice. I remember my first year, I mean, my first year professionally, I was like, okay, this is going to be my pricing. And every single wedding vendors, wedding photographers in France told me, this is not going to work. You're too expensive. This is not the U.S. market. You're going to fail. And my reply was like, maybe I'm going to fail, so I will be out of the business. But if I want to make it, I don't have a choice. This is what I'm going to have to charge. But how did you skip it? You know, it's interesting. I, I interviewed Lori Ahrens, um, who has a similar story, not in terms of leaving a job. We worked with Lori a couple of months, couple of months ago together. Oh, did you? Yeah. But Lori has a similar story in terms of right from the start going for that high end market and she was able to pull it off. And that is so hard to do. You know, as far as you're concerned, how did you, <laughs> how did you do it? I mean, what was your portfolio? You said you had shot maybe one wedding or maybe for five years you had shot some weddings. How do you present yourself so that the people in the luxury market understand the value of, of what you're doing, uh, of what you're charging? How did you pull that off? I think the key to that was to be really focused. I had shot weddings for five years next to my day job. This is not the portfolio that I wanted to show. The minute I went professional, I decided to focus on U.S. clients getting married in Europe. Hmm. I am based in Paris. I am European, and I think I'm European in the way I did things, I mean, which can be kind of different from uh, being an American. So I was like, I see some amazing clients who fly a photographer from the U.S. I feel I can do a decent job, so I'm going to try to get these clients and make them save some money on flying someone from the States. I speak decent English because I've lived in the States. I kind of know the American culture, but I keep that European touch. So I think I have something to bring to the table. So from day one, I decided to focus on that clientele. So it means I was communicating only in the States. I was only posting on Instagram when the American clients were up, even though I am based in France. 
And as of a sudden, people started to see me almost as an American based in Paris, and I kind of like that. So I think what made a difference is to be very, very focused on a niche. I didn't mean to go and shoot weddings in the States, which kind of happens right now sometimes. But I was like, we have such an amazing market here in Europe. I mean, the south of France, Italy, Lake Como, the Amalfikos, you name it. And there are so many American clients doing destination weddings here. I want to add these clients. Well, but but great. How how did you get these, again, we'll call them luxury, these luxury clients from America to be aware of you? I think that branding as a whole made a difference. If there is something I can do is branding because I did that for 10 years. And branding to me is... Um, different from communication. Communication is a part of branding. So for example, shooting film, which is something I have always done, was something important because I was one of the first photographers to shoot film in Europe. It was a differentiation. It helped me to stand out on the market. And as of a sudden, you show film images and film images, there were a lot of them in the States, but not that many in Europe. You show these weddings in Europe on film. So all of a sudden, there is the attention of the American clientele. So film was an element of differentiation. Instagram was for sure, because all of a sudden, you have access to clients all over the place. And I've been on Instagram for probably, I don't know, six or seven years, if not more. So I was not at the very beginning, but kind of at the beginning of Instagram. Uh, and using the right hashtags, posting at the right moments, having your weddings published on Martha Stewart, on Style Me Pretty. I mean, everything was focused on putting my work in front of American clients. That's well, that hmm, that is so interesting to me. And 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 you have built up to you have approximately as of today seventy thousand Instagram followers, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that is really significant. You know, in a in a moment, I want to come back to uh, to you know the social media and how you utilize it. But earlier, you also mentioned that you understand the American culture, but that you also have a European touch. And and I'll, and we'll get into film too in a moment. Can you is it? Can you put into words what you mean when you say that you have a European touch? Simply the fact of shooting in European location is going to be part of it. It's always fun to me to oh, realize yeah. that I, I live I live by the Eiffel Tower, and when I post a photo of a couple in front of the Eiffel Tower, I'm going to score so well on Instagram, even though personally I'm honestly <laughs> so tired of shooting in front of the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> right. And on the other side, if I'm going to shoot a couple in Yosemite, or uh, on the West Coast in, Ca- in California, I'm going to be so excited because this is different from what I used to see. This is something actually that also excites me a lot uh, because I love like outdoors, big landscapes. But as of a sudden, I don't score as well as when I post in European locations. Well, it's very romantic to us Americans. You know, it, it just is. It just is anything in Europe. So romanticism is going to be a part of it. Maybe fashion is going to be another part of it. Being based in mm-hmm. Paris, I have lots of fashion clients I worked for. So, I mean, having worked so much in fashion the last couple of years, maybe I approach the bridal portraits with a fashion touch, and that's something clients are going to like. A, bi- a word which is really important to me is differentiation. How can you differentiate yourself from everything else and bring something new to the table? And for a long time, being a European photographer working with American clients was definitely a part of it. Mm. And you mentioned film, you know, and your website says shooting medium format film. What, what does that mean, medium format? So medium format is basically, uh, let's say, the highest possible quality uh, you can find right now. Medium format digital is going to be very expensive to shoot right now because we're talking about cameras that are worth like 30 grand, 40 grand. But the good news about film is that right now you have access to amazing medium format film cameras at a low price. So the quality is amazing. The depth of field is amazing. And still, they are very easy to shoot, and it doesn't require any time in terms of editing because your photo lab is going to do that for you. So this is one of the reasons why I love film. 
Hmm. And coming back to the social media for a moment before, you, you had mentioned using the right hashtags, publishing at the right moment. What advice would you give about finding out what the right hashtags are? I definitely think it's so much more difficult today than it used to be, like, let's say, five years ago, because if there is something which is saturated right now, it's Instagram. And I cannot wait for what's next. (laughs) Right. And there is going to be something next. There always is. Of course, there's going to be something next. Yeah. And in the meantime, I invest a lot of money on my website because I've always considered my website as my home. And that's what's going to be left once Facebook is done, Instagram is done, etc. But I mean, Instagram is going to be a matter of consistency. Are you sure you always post with a great consistency? Are you, are your nine last images perfect and work well together? And in terms of hashtag, once again, I don't use them a lot anymore because what used to work five years ago doesn't really work again today. I mean, if you look at destination wedding photographer, hashtag destination wedding photographer, for example, there's going to be millions of photos behind it. But I must say that five years ago, this is something that worked very really well. I see. There were lower amount, and so it, it came up more in people's feeds. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, also, you when you mentioned that you're you know you're doing fashion, and and I I understand you know that clients you know also love that kind of an of an approach. I know you're doing fashion jobs, you're doing editorials, you've got billboards, you've got photos on billboards. What percentage of your business is related to fashion and also editorials? Over the past couple of years, I would say 20%. This year it has definitely been bigger because I had this uh, big job for Balenciaga uh, that was massive in terms of time and also financially. But I will say that it's 20%. So we're talking about fashion brands calling for campaigns. We're talking about fashion brands using me for backstage photos because here in Paris, we have fashion weeks every six weeks. So there are so many of them. So there's a lot of opportunities to work in fashion where, when, you work in the, when you work in Paris. I've always seen me as a wedding photographer first because this is where I have my heart. But it's just interesting for me to see something different and to also be able to shoot in the low season here. Because what we we must admit is that in Europe, the wedding season is very, very concentrated between May and October. Mm. I do 80% of my wedding jobs on this time frame. Ah, so you fill in the rest of the year with with, uh, a lot of the fashion and editorial work. Exactly. And, you know, in terms of clients being attracted to that kind of style, they are obviously more educated now, you know, more than ever before. You know, they, they're utilizing uh, social media and for various reasons, there's just much more information available. So it seems that expectations for clients have risen. How do you feel about that, their, their level of education and what their expectations are? I totally agree. And, it, and it's definitely one of the reasons why I cannot wait. Um, about what's next after Instagram, we always have big fights with my, with my fiance because she's all about Instagram and I'm like, oh my God, I'm so tired of it. And one of the reasons is, I mean, it's difficult right now to show up on a wedding and the bride has not compiled like 20 pages of like Pinterest boards and like Instagram photos that she has seen everywhere. So the clients are definitely much more educated and the pitfall of that is that some, sometimes they just want you to reproduce the 20 best photos that they've seen on Instagram without considering the fact that a wedding is a live event, the weather might be difficult, the wind might be difficult, the timeline might be difficult. So they don't take that into consideration and they build these high expectations just because they have spent the last six months on Instagram compiling everything they like. Then what is your process with a client? You know, from the time you meet them and they bring these Pinterest boards and all of that, how how do you work with a client from the very beginning? The first thing I I say is that I will take into consideration uh, their board, but they have booked me. They have booked me for a reason, which is my style, and I will never try to reproduce a photo. So I will try to interpret 
what they mean by their board. So for example, if there's a lot of sunset photos, I know that they will want a lot of photos at the golden hour. If there's a lot of details photos, I will say, okay, this client, what's really important for them are the details. But I never take the boards like per se, like, okay, I'm going to do like every single of these photos because this never works. And so what do you do then? How do you communicate with them about that? And, and what is your next step? Basically, just manag- managing expectations and mentioning again and again that they have booked me for my style. They should trust me with the fact that the wedding photos that I'm going to produce are going to be very much in line with what I deliver and the reason why they have booked me for. But it's all a question of managing expectations and mentioning that my job on the D-Day is not to be reproducing exactly the photos that they have compiled in their board. You know, I really like that you're direct with them, that you say to them, you've hired me for my style. You know, I I just, I like, uh, why not, right? Why not be direct with a client? You know what? Every time, and and maybe that's another thing that I've learned in my previous job, but Every time I have not been direct with a client, even though I knew it was the right thing to do, there has been problems. And I know it's difficult at the beginning of your career because, I mean, you want every single job and you want to please your clients. But every time you leave some shadows on what you can do or cannot do, there's going to be a problem. Mm. Also, you're dealing with people being very vulnerable, right? I mean, when they're, you know, having their photos taken, especially if uh, a bride, if there's a bride involved, you know, so much of the focus is on them. And I'm wondering how you deal with how you manage the, the, just the vulnerability, the anxiety that, that a couple will, will get from, from that. I learned through the years that the good answer to that is confidence People want to feel that you're in charge and you know what you're doing. And I tend to feel that the reason why the bride is going to send you like boards and uh, inspirations is because the wedding's going to be on a couple of hours. I mean, on 10 hours on a single day. And she has like prepared it for like so long that she wants to make sure it's going to be perfect. Mm. The moment when she realizes that you're in charge you know what you're doing, you're calm, everything disappears. She's uh, not talking about boards anymore. Yeah. And I always give that example that at the end of the wedding, when I say goodbye to the bride and groom on the dance floor, 99% of the case, they're going to be like, okay, Greg, thank you so much. We love your job. And I always make that very bad joke saying, okay, just wait to see the photos. <laughs> but <laughs> It's funny because you realize that the way you behave, the way you reassure them, uh, it's almost like psychology during the day. At the end of the day, they are already 100% convinced of your services, even though they still have not seen one photo. Mm, Right. And when that's the case, 100% of them are going to tell you, oh my God, Greg, I love the photos. So I think confidence and uh, experience, I mean, longevity on the market, I mean, I've been shooting weddings for 10 years, so I guess it helps also to be more confident with bride and groom than at the beginning. But once you bring that to the table, everything else disappears, and I think it's a good way to manage the bride and groom anxiety on the day. That's such a great point. You know, if you were giving a masterclass to some, you know, photographers who want to get to the level that you are, what would you focus on? What would be some of your biggest, most important tips and advice? I actually gave a masterclass yesterday afternoon in Paris, so this is very fresh in my mind. <laughs> okay. But the biggest thing I tell them is you need to get out of your comfort zone. And When we're talking about comfort zone, when we're talking about self-confidence, you realize that 90% of people who work in the wedding industry, their own limit is themselves. And we're talking about planner, we're talking about florists, we're talking about cake designers, we're talking about photographers. And I talk about that a lot when we talk about pricing. People are like, oh, I cannot charge it. And I mean, why not? Who knows? And it's funny because a couple of years ago, you had a photographer coming to me and say, Greg, I want to, I want to consult with you because 
we are on the same inquiries, but the clients book you for budgets that are, go that are going to be like $15,000, $20,000. And they book me when their budget is $5,000. How come? And I'm like, but do you even propose like $15,000 in your packages? Mm, right. And he's like, no. And I'm like, why? Because I'm not worth it. Okay, so why would you complain that clients won't book you for $15,000 if it's not even part of your packages? Mm. So getting out of your comfort zone is going to be key. And it's funny, I think it's something that we all have. I mean, when I launched myself as a, as a professional photographer, my first question was like, who am I to pretend that I'm a professional photographer? I don't have a degree. I was even like considering the fact of like getting a degree in photography just to get that stamp. And at one point I was like, mm, no, I don't have to prove it to anyone. I'm just going to grab it. I have clients. So that means people like what I do. So why not? And, you know, in terms of, of giving advice to a bridal couple on how to choose a great photographer, like, like how would you, I, I think what a couple would like to know is what are the differences between being a good versus a great photographer so that they can make that decision? I always say there's two elements we need to consider. The first one is style. Of course, we need to love the photos and we need to love the aesthetic. And the second one is the personality and what we need to check is the full gallery of a client, of a photographer. Because the world we live in, people post photos on Instagram, but they're going to show you the best photo or the two best photos of a wedding. And the client wants to make sure that the work of the photographer is consistent through the day. So from shooting the details to shooting the venue, to the portraits, to the ceremony, to the dancing party with a flash. So they will need to check a full gallery of the photographer, but the first two elements are styles and personality. Hmm. Because, I, I mean, I'm going to spend more time with the bride during the wedding day than she spends with the groom. So <laughs> That's right. <laughs> that's right. That's true. That's really important. And I know, you know, we mentioned earlier, you're going to be speaking uh, very soon uh, in a few weeks at Engage. What is the topic that you're going to be talking about? Actually, it's not finalized yet, but I really want to talk about the, what I call the authentic branding. Once again, branding is really important to me because I think that building a brand is what's going to make a difference on the long term between someone who stands out in the industry, whether he's a planner, a photographer, or florist. The brand is going to make a whole difference, but people uh, usually I realize they don't realize all of the elements we have behind a brand. A brand is going to be the product you offer, the service you offer. It's going to be your network. It's going to be your communication. It's going to be your ethics. It's going to be the values you are for your company. It's going to be so many different things. And people tend to think that branding and marketing is basically just communication. And I think it's so much more. And the reason why I added authentic is because once again, humility and authenticity is something that is so important to me because I think it's crucial to build a company on the long term. And I think because of Instagram, we have so many people right now who pretend to live a life which is not their real life. That's right. And I think that's a problem because. It's going to be misleading for the clients and you can get lost here. So I want to focus on the topic that I kind of call the authentic branding. Hmm. Well, and obviously this applies to anybody, not just photography. So I think you've chosen a wonderful topic. I, I think that's going to be really interesting. Absolutely. I, I want to address all of wedding vendors because I just realized once again that this is a big need on the market. And people need some keys in terms of marketing and in terms of business. Yes, yes. Oh, absolutely. We could all use that. And as far as the photographers who are listening, I understand that you also give workshops? I do. I give one workshop a year. It's been two years that I've called it the home workshop because I do it at home. So in my studio, which is also the place where I live in Paris, so that's where I host my workshop and I have 20 attendees every year. So usually it's in the spring and I'm currently designing the next one. So it's going to be in the spring of 2020. 
And I'm currently designing the dates and the style shoot and the partners who are going to be with me on it. So the announcement is going to be made pretty soon. Okay. And we'll include in the show notes, you know, all the information about the workshops. I understand you also sell gift cards through your uh, website. Is that right? I have a print shop where I sell my prints because thanks to wedding photography, I've traveled so much. And I just love like also like shooting landscapes and travel photos. So I do have a print shop on which you can buy the prints or you can just decide to offer gift cards. Wonderful. Well, yeah, we'll also include that. And, and just a uh, last question for photographers listening. What is your favorite equipment that you are currently using? So my favorite equipment is definitely my main camera, which is the Contact 645 coupled with the 80 millimeter lens, Carlisle lens. Uh, this is my film camera. This is the camera and the lens I shoot like 90% of my work with. My second favorite will be my iPhone. <laughs> I, I'm not a big like equipment guy. I mean, if you see me on a wedding, I just have one camera in my hand. I cannot work with like a strap with like three cameras around me. I'm going to sweat too much. <laughs> right. So I just like, Keep it simple. And if, if I need to zoom in or out, I just move. I get closer to my subjects or further away. I try to keep it really simple. Well, wonderful. Greg, I really appreciate the time that you've taken. I, I'm very interested to uh, maybe talk to you again about branding, uh, specifically that. That's, that's something that, uh, again, all of us are always struggling to understand even better. So I'm so glad that you're going to be speaking on that at Engage. And again, thank you so much for being on the show. This, is, this has been really wonderful. Thank you, Andy. This has been really exciting. Thank you for listening to my conversation with Greg Fink. Be sure to check out his website at gregfink.com. That's Greg and then F-I-N-C-K, gregfink.com. His social media handle is his name as well, Greg Fink. And you can get all of that in the show notes at our website of theweddingbiz.com. And also, I mention somewhat often, somewhat regularly, uh, I ask about sharing these episodes with your friends and colleagues. And it really is a great way to help anyone who can benefit from it. It's also the best way to help grow our community, as is giving a great review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast from. So I'm very grateful when, when you all share the episodes and, and when you leave a great review. Thank you. And don't forget to listen to our follow-on segment every Wednesday that goes with each week's interview called The Next Level. And wait till you hear who I have for this Wednesday. Anyway, The Next Level is in which I have a guest co-host, and together we tease out some of the highlights of the interview of the week to help break them down and deliver specific tactics and tips for you to use to raise your own business to the next level. And here we go. This week's guest co-host is going to be Lori Ahrens. That's right. I know almost all of you know who Lori is. Very popular planner. She has been on the show, on The Wedding Biz. Lori has been featured in numerous magazine publications and was listed in Vogue, Harper's Bazaar, and Martha Stewart Weddings as one of the top planners worldwide. Her clients include trendsetters and prominent business moguls. She also runs a very successful wedding planner masterclass, so tune in Wednesday. And then next week on Monday, our guest is going to be another uh, popular person in the industry, Vanessa Krekel of Two Paper Dolls. Vanessa's company is a pioneering custom design house offering branding and logo development, website design and development, and custom invitations and stationery. And so Vanessa had so much wisdom to share about all of these topics. Be sure to tune in next Monday. And we want to thank our sponsor, Kushner Entertainment. Absolutely incredible music and entertainment working worldwide. Check out uh, Kushner Entertainment at kushnerentertainment.com. And we'll catch you all next week on The Wedding Biz. <laughs>